Hmm. You know... I recall seeing a building that was burning something, and there was smoke bellowing out, but what building was it? Was it the Grand Cathedral? No. Was it the Church of the Good Chalice burning down? No, not in all the armor. Was it towards Yahagul? No, not Yahagul. Oh, oh, wait! Why, there it is! There's where the giant pillar of smoke is coming from! It's coming out of a building known as the Orphanage! Oh, yes, there we go! Okay. But I wonder why we never get to see what the Orphanage is burning! All I ever found inside was a bunch of monsters, a couple of stools, rows of pairs of coffins, whatever this thing is, and jars of burning incense filled with human bones! And I wonder what all these scavenging crows are doing flocking around the smell of the smoke! Maybe they're burning something yummy in there, like cookies, or a turkey, or a OH WAIT IT'S CHILDREN! We're off to a good start. The Orphanage is probably one of the most frightening areas in all of Bloodborne. It's one of only three non-boss areas of the game that plays ambient music in the background. It's unusually dark and difficult to see, and it contains one of the few jump scares that exist in the game. It's clearly meant to be an especially dark, brooding and eerie area of the game. Until very recently, I honestly wouldn't spend too much time in the Orphanage because it's a pretty unsettling place. Crawling around the orphanage are these tiny little slug human hybrids known as celestial children, and they're probably some of the most dangerous enemies in the entire game. The orphanage key tells us the orphanage, shattered by the Grand Cathedral, was a place of scholarship and experimentation, where young orphans became potent unseen thinkers for the healing church. The choir that would lead us split from the Healing Church was a creation of the Orphanage. The key tells us that the Orphanage is raising elite prodigy children, like Yuri the Last Scholar, and a character who's named in the guidebook as Choir Intelligencer Edgar. There's something particularly special about them, and given that they use weapons and items that scale greatly with Arcane, they seem to have some innate gift to manipulate cosmic powers. Since Edgar and Yuri are pretty human looking, the Orphanage is responsible for collecting and raising both inhuman celestial children as well as brilliant young humans like Yuri and Edgar. It could be that the Orphanage is burning celestial children, or it could be human children, or it could be the parents of the children, or it could be the cookie theory, who can really know for certain, I don't. Just kidding, a secret note on the ascent towards the Orphanage reads, The sky and the cosmos are one, the choir. The Cosmic Eye Watcher badge also repeats the choir's revelation, the choir stumbled upon an epiphany very suddenly and quite by accident. Here we stand, feet planted in the earth, but might the cosmos be very near us, only just above our heads? As we've understood that to mean, the various universes in Bloodborne are literally stacked on top of each other. Presumably, the hunter's dream is at the very bottom, with the enormous pillars keeping the other layers stable and aloft. The message, Awaken Above Ground, also insinuates that the hunter's dream is at the very bottom, and the waking world, the nightmares, and the moonside lake are all above it. As can be seen in the hunter's nightmare, a completely random snail woman falls from the sky and dies. After the hunter ascends the research hall and clock tower, he arrives at the fishing hamlet where snail women are prevalent, and entire cities can be seen far beneath the waters. Hence, it was a snail woman in the fishing hamlet who fell to her death in the nightmare version of Yarnum. Be careful. Be careful. No, wait, wait, what? The odd masts of shipwrecks show us that the Nightmare Frontier and Nightmare Mensis exist on top of the Hunter's Nightmare, and the Nightmare version of the Fishing Hamlet. So when the choir states, the sky and the cosmos are one, they mean it literally. By travelling upwards, a person can potentially arrive at a higher plane of existence, and travelling downwards can potentially lead to a lower plane. These planes exist entirely stacked, but they typically can't be seen from lower levels looking upwards. By burning something, the choir is effectively sending the vaporized essences of those things upwards to a higher plane of existence. And the Nightmare Frontier, which is presumably one of the highest levels, there exists a peculiar lake of poison and strange, partly feminine, partly snail, squid creatures known as crawlers. The crawlers have a particular attack where they rear upwards and release a poisonous fume of gas, and within a suspiciously vaginal-like mouth, we can actually see messengers squirming around quite helplessly stuck in the maw of the crawler. Okay, so putting all the puzzle pieces together, it looks like the orphanage is burning certain children. Those children ascend to a higher plane of existence as a vaporized gas, almost like their spirits or souls are ascending to heaven. 
they arrive at the Nightmare Frontier as a green ooze. These semi-motherly, bottom-feeding crawler things consume the green liquid and reform the children from inside them. What you might also notice about the Nightmare Frontier is that it's one of the very few locations in the game that includes helpful little messengers who light lanterns wherever the hunter has already traveled to. The Nightmare Frontier is also the only place where the hunter can find the item known as the Messenger's Gift. The massive, tentacle and eyeball-ridden heads are made up of a collection of deceased messengers. So the messengers are very, very prevalent in the Nightmare Frontier. The Ritual Blood, a most peculiar item, depicts skullish, hellish faces forming out of the blood, and the Blood Gym Workshop tool tells us, Blood defines an organism. While the Air Rune tells us, perhaps the Air is a hunter who hears the echoing will of those before him and it's clearly an image of DNA. So people's will is actually present within their blood or DNA. When the children are vaporized, they're not exactly dead. It's more that they exist in a spiritual, whimsical, airy form. They collect in the Nightmare Frontier and the crawlers either kind of consume and eat them, or helpfully reform and rebirth them like a mother, or it could be both. Before the DLC released, and explained exactly what the masks are supposed to be, they're actually a symbol of a lost voyage. The souls of children are trying to ascend to heaven, but they get caught in a net of blood like a school of fish. The mighty tower at the end of the frontier, which is supposed to be like a lighthouse, is instead headed by an evil creature known as the Amygdala, which bears the same spelling but different pronunciation as the region of the brain known as the Amygdala, which processes fear. The winter lanterns appear in nightmare realms where child sacrifice has taken place. They exist just aside the Orphan of Cause and the well where Lady Maria threw her sword. They exist near Murgo's Loft, and they exist in the highly vaginal caverns and caves of the Nightmare Frontier. This is all a metaphor for the womb of a particularly nasty woman who may not have the best intentions for the children she's bearing. In their liquid form, the infants can be absorbed by plants, and just as the Blood Gym Workshop tool tells us blood defines an organism, when those plants drink the green waters, they're essentially drinking the spirits of dead children, and then those plants become those children. The large, earthly, rock-throwing creatures in the Nightmare Frontier are actually called in the official guidebook, Giant Lost Children. The Bastard of Laurent tells us, Remains of an infant infected by the scourge, a harbinger of curses and symbol of defilement. And it appears to be a deceased messenger. What's even more peculiar is that while there are statues of messengers in the canals of Yarnum, there are also statues of messengers in the underground labyrinths, but they appear more like furry, beastly creatures than the peculiar and deformed creatures in the hunter's dream. So it appears that some children become infected with the plague, or it could be that they are born already infected with the plague? As Simon's hollowed garb tells us, certain church hunters obfuscate their identities and slip into the nooks and crannies of the city. This is the garb that allows these hollowed individuals to go unnoticed. These hunters are keen to early signs of the scourge, serving as a first line of defense against its outbreak. So the church employs certain hunters to pretend to be beggars. They keep an eye on the population and preemptively eliminate people who show signs of the infection. If the Bastard of Laurent is an infant infected with the plague, it seems that the church kidnaps the infant, sends him to the orphanage, murders him, and cremates the body. The fact that the Bastard of Laurent appears to be scorched and kind of sooty lends credit to this idea. The Oil Urn tells us, Sometimes when hunters burn beasts, they appear intoxicated by the euphoria of purification. So burning and cremation somehow purifies the body and eliminates the beast plague. When the church cremates the orphans, they're somewhat trying to purify their spirits. When the messengers are murdered young and then cremated, they never have the opportunity to mature and grow old like the two Yarnum citizens in the chapel have. Their innocence is immortally preserved, so it's like the messengers are the literal embodiments of young innocence. In fact, after the lonely old woman goes mad, she begins to treat the hunter like a child, and she ventures out into the dangerous world to pick up medicine for the hunter. As she does, she leaves two notes which read, Hold on, just wait a wee bit, my little dearie, and wait just a wee bit longer, my little sweet pea. So it seems like the lonely old woman had a child at one point in time, her little dearie and little sweet pea. She left to get something for the child, but when she got back, the child was gone presumably kidnapped and sent to the orphanage to be cremated, experimented on, or raised as a prodigy of the choir. If the lonely old woman is attacked after she goes mad, she actually says, What's wrong with you? I'm your mother! Don't you see? <laughs> so that does confirm that she's confusing the hunter with her own child. And if she's killed, she says, Jehovah's blood which is a very, very interesting line. 
Given that she offers a number of sedatives to the hunter, and given that the sedatives read, liquid medicine concocted at Bergenworth calms the nerves, those who delve into the arcane fall all too easily into madness, and thick human blood serves to calm the frayed nerves of these inquisitive minds. It seems like she's feeding her husband's blood to the hunter, and she mistakes the hunter for her child. It's rather morally questionable that the lonely old woman would give, you know, a pretty powerful drug to her own child. Unless, of course, her child was just a celestial child. And when a celestial child bites, it actually causes frenzy buildup, and a sedative must be used to counteract the attack. So putting these pieces together, it looks like the lonely old woman might have actually given birth to a celestial child, which she loved very dearly, and she fed her husband's blood to the celestial child but the child was later kidnapped and sent to the orphanage. The messenger in festival reads, why not let them be happy and revel as babes? While the white messenger ribbon reads, a ribbon more suited to pretty young girls than silly old messengers. So the text conflicts with itself as it describes the messengers as being childlike while also being old. So it further lends credit to the idea that the children are murdered young and their youth and innocence is forever immortalized. They can grow old, but they cannot mature. They cannot become adults. It's quite similar to the orphan of Cars, who is referred to as a poor wizen child. So it's shriveled and old, but also still a child. In some sense, it's remarkably similar to the messengers of the dream. The Urn Festival also reads, The messengers wear the urns upside down, suggesting a predilection to the dark. So that could mean that they're, that they're Tumerian, and like Queen Yarnum with her enormous black eyes, they've evolved to survive specifically in subterranean environments, or it could mean that they're more suited to existing inside a woman's womb, where it's dark and, and cozy, I guess. I don't know. That's, it's been a while, I guess, since I've been there. But it, right. So if the children are sacrificed, it's probably at a very early stage in the children's developments. As can be seen on BloodborneWiki.com, Jura's attire, excluding his hat, has the highest frenzy resistance in the game. His hat is outmoded by Aline's beak mask, which reads, The beak contains incense to mask scents of blood and beast. So the items with the highest frenzy resistance also have a special connection to ash and incense, and that wards off beasts. I'm not entirely sure what that means. I've speculated that the incense might be the spirits of the messengers protecting people and chasing away the beasts. It's a little similar to From Software's recent game about fairies, but I think it might have something to do with parasites. When in doubt, blame the parasites. So it seems like the incense is manufactured in the orphanage, and when the vases of incense are cracked open, bones fall out. So it's like the church is also sacrificing and cremating people as a weapon against the beast plague. If we also look at Madman's knowledge and Great One's wisdom, it displays a spiritual, almost gaseous slug-type creature fuming out of a gash in the skull. As discussed in the video about parasites, phantasms feed on arcane energy that accumulates in the brain. They're also like leeches, sucking away the person's identity until there's nothing left. Even upon the host's death, the phantasms can still survive, and when those skulls and bones are burnt in incense, the phantasms are released into the air as a gaseous vapor. As we can see at the fishing hamlet, slugs are used as fuel to burn candles, so presumably they serve as a kind of flammable oil of some kind. In one of From Software's favorite sources of inspiration, Berserk, two protagonists, Guts and Casca, have sex, and Casca gets pregnant. Their mutual friend Griffith rises to a state of godhood, rapes Casca, and his own identity is inserted into her womb and sort of hijacks and mutates the child within her. While the divine rape is so traumatic for Casca that she regresses to a childish, infantile state of mind, the mutated child is still born as a kind of demon, and she seems to love it regardless of its demonism. Ariana's celestial child and Casca's moonlight child are quite similar in appearance, so if their stories parallel each other, then we can now understand how Ariana got pregnant. Ariana is referred to on several occasions as a lady of the night or prostitute. It's perfectly possible that she's already pregnant with a child when she arrives at Odin Chapel. Skull-dwelling parasitic phantasms are being burnt in the vases of incense, so when Ariana breathes in the great quantity of incense, she's suddenly infected with semi-godly slugs. When the red moon descends, the slugs infect the child within her womb and mutate its identity into a slug-human hybrid, and that's presumably where all the other celestial children come from. Ariana has a more potent and effective blood than what Adela has, and given that Ariana wears the same noble dress that's found in Canis, she's presumably born from a noble Canis lineage. 
She's also probably already pregnant when she arrives at Odin Chapel, where vaporized slugs are swimming around in the air. So all these factors combined lead to Ariana's pregnancy. Ariana is an ideal host for the slugs to infect her womb. The only bit I'm really confused about is the red moon. I, I don't really know how mechanically how the red moon works. It descends and suddenly the line between man and beast is blurred, but how exactly does that trigger the slugs to mutate Ariana's child? I don't really know. As the milkweed rune tells us, those who take this oath become a lumen wood that peers towards the sky, feeding phantasms in its luscious bed. Plants go through a process called photosynthesis, by which they absorb the sun's energy. The lumen flower garden, on the other hand, is filled with flowers that absorb the moon's energy. So the moon presence showers the garden with celestial light. The lumen flowers absorb that energy and become rather powerful, god-like flowers. Little slug-like parasites are then attracted to and feed off of that energy. Hence the milkweed rune states, feeding phantasms in his luscious bed. So the lumen flower garden is specifically used to feed these leech-like slugs who consume the moon's power and become somewhat godly in the process. If you'll notice about the lumen flowers, they're actually pretty phallic in appearance. The celestial emissaries are also pretty phallic as well, and the boss among them drops the communion rune, which can be interpreted as depicting either a leaf or a phallus. So these lumen flowers also emit a kind of heavenly aroma similar to what's being burnt in the incense, and somehow that leads to communion. In Christian religion, there is the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each is its own individual entity, but they're all also God. God comes to the Virgin Mary in the form of the Holy Spirit and impregnates Mary with his voice. So it's the word and command of God and the act of communion that leads to the birth of Jesus, who is also God in human form. Rosemary is actually a symbol of the Virgin Mary in the real world. And quite coincidentally, Rosemarinus is the scientific name for Rosemary. A special weapon used by the choir, high-ranking members of the healing church, sprays a cloud of sacred mist created by using blood-imbued quicksilver bullets as a special medium. Arias, or melodies, are heard wherever the sacred mist is seen, proving that the mist is a heavenly blessing. O oh, fair maiden, why is it that you weep? So what's actually going on with the Rosemarinus is that it sprays a liquid quicksilver, and when the quicksilver is inhaled, the person hears the language and music of the Great Ones. Communion is actually achieved not through spoken language, but through odors emitted by godly flowers and incense, and communion isn't necessarily just talking. It's also the act by which a pregnant woman becomes even more pregnant with a slug-human flower hybrid just as God comes to Mary and uses his voice to impregnate her with Jesus in an act of communion. Did you follow that? Also quite coincidentally, the vermilion rose is also a symbol of the Virgin Mary. Vermilion comes from the French word for, literally, vermin, because it was from certain vermin insects that certain vivid bright crimson dyes were extracted, specifically a species known as Kermes vermilio, which feeds off of, guess what, the sap of certain trees. Even more coincidentally, in the Victorian age, mercury, also known as quicksilver, was mined from cinnabar rocks, and one such kind was known as vermilion cinnabar, named such for its bright crimson color. Later paintings depicting the Virgin Mary often used vermilion cinnabar to brightly color the most important aspects of her character and draw the eye to her and other chief characters. As Redgrave pointed out in his video concerning Odin, he concludes that Odin is actually the Quicksilver, and it's a very compelling case. The most important bit of evidence is with the formless Odin rune, which states, those who memorize this rune enjoy a larger supply of Quicksilver bullets. Human or no, the oozing blood is a medium of the highest grade and the essence of the formless Great One Odin. Both Odin and his inadvertent worshippers surreptitiously seek the precious blood. So the formless Odin rune fairly clearly points to the Quicksilver as being Odin, hence the oozing blood is the essence of formless Odin. There you go. But it's also peculiar that Odin seeks the precious blood if the oozing blood is also the essence <coughs> is also the essence of Odin. So either Odin is the oozing blood and the precious blood is a different kind of blood, or Odin is sort of seeking himself or something. But honestly, here's what I think is probably what's really going on, right? So honestly, the Quicksilver is basically like God's semen. So is it mercury that's burning in the incense? Yes, probably. And there are probably parasites living in that mercury and feeding off of it. And when it enters the body of a woman, she becomes pregnant with God's child. And where does the God's semen Quicksilver come from? Probably from the highly penis-shaped lumen flowers that are absorbing the moon's energy. This is probably the source of the church's special blood.
As the communion rune tells us, this rune represents the healing church and its ministers. Blood ministration is, of course, the pursuit of communion. And what is the ultimate goal of communion? Just as God communed with Mary and impregnated her, the healing church is trying to commune with the Great Ones and experience divine pregnancy. Do the citizens of Yarnum know this? Probably not. Ariana is quite shocked by what happens to her, so the kidnappers are probably not just stealing infants infected with the plague. They're also probably kidnapping celestial children. And even further, the Odin Writhe rune states, Writhe sees a subtle mucus in the warmth of blood and acknowledges visceral attacks as one of the darker hunter techniques. Visceral attacks restore quicksilver bullets. Okay, so the Odin Writhe rune allows the hunter to extract quicksilver from people's bodies by performing a visceral attack. And a visceral attack is where the hunter literally shoves his hand through a person's abdomen and pulls out. So it's like the hunter is reaching into a woman's womb. That's where the god semen quicksilver is accumulating. And I would also assume that the subtle mucus that it's talking about, that's a very deliberate choice of words. Because slugs produce a kind of mucus, and that mucus actually absorbs water. And what makes a banana slug so peculiarly slug-like is its glorious slime. They're covered in it, but why? Slime is a brilliant solution to many problems that slugs face in the forest. Slugs are mostly water, which means they deal constantly with the threat of dehydration. And you'd think that laying down that thick layer of slime would be hard to maintain and use up a bunch of water. But slime actually attracts water. It's produced by cells in the slug's skin called goblet cells. Tiny granules of mucus emerge from the cells, then pop open and absorb water from the surroundings. One mucus granule can absorb a hundred times its own volume in water. Slime also helps slugs find each other over huge distances, at least huge slug distances. Chemicals in slime trails tell slugs which direction another slug was headed, maybe leading it to a potential mate. Well, you've got your liquids, that's where molecules float randomly all over the place. And you've got your solids, where molecules are packed closely together, fixed in place. A liquid crystal, that's what slime is, is in between those two things. The molecules are aligned with their neighbors, but they can move and flow together. This structure gives slime a strange ability to be either a lubricant or an adhesive, slick or sticky. I was in discussion with a Reddit user who postulated that the lumen flowers produce a kind of sap, and the sap is the quicksilver, which could very well be the case. I think it's that the flowers absorb the moon's energy and the little phantasm slugs eat the leaves of the lumen flowers, and they produce a godly mucus. That mucus is the quicksilver, and that's what's fed to the population during communion. As with slug mucus in the real world, it's something between a solid and a liquid, and it forms and reforms fluidly. If the Quicksilver is the Healing Church's special blood, that might explain why the population is rapidly evolving and reforming into monstrous beasts. It has to do with the Quicksilver mucus. Mercury can be consumed as a liquid, or it can be absorbed as a gaseous vapor, and it's far more deadly as a vapor than as a liquid. The body absorbs it far more efficiently. One of the unfortunate side effects of mercury poisoning is that it can cause harmful mutations in the underdeveloped children of pregnant women. This might explain part of the real-world inspiration for why Ariana's child is so deformed. If you'll notice about the formless Odin rune, this little curve right here symbolizes the enlarged, bulging stomach of a pregnant woman. There are three puncture marks and blood gushing out from the wounds, insinuating that the child is sacrificed. And in the case of Odin, the child is deformed and his identity is consumed by parasites. The three marks can also be interpreted as each belonging to an individual participant of the divine pregnancy. There is a man, a woman, and a third divine creature to interact in the relationship, just as with Berserk, where the birth of the Moonlight Child requires a man, a woman, and a god. In Bloodborne, that third entity is actually the Moon Presence, whose image can be seen throughout the Lumenflower Garden. And if we look especially close, we notice the skulls beneath the Moon Presence, the moon presence atop them all, and her fuming, vaporous, airy hair swirling above it all. This is the depiction of what's going on in Erden Chapel. Reddit user Last Protagonist translated much of the text and formed a connection that Formless Odin and the moon presence might be the same thing. I would agree. Odin and the moon presence are the same thing in the same way that the Father and the Holy Spirit are the same God. 
Formless Odin, who exists as a voice, is like the Holy Spirit, which formed as a voice when impregnating Mary. The third chord that Ariana's child drops reads, Every Great One loses its child, and then yearns for a surrogate. In Odin, the Formless Great One is no different. To think it was corrupted blood that began this eldritch liaison. So the word liaison has a sexual connotation as well as an immoral one. That is deliberate. Ariana is a prostitute and she gets pregnant by the actions of a man who is not her husband. And the child is mutated by a god without any kind of deliberate ceremony. The pregnancy is completely unintentional. The shoes that Ariana wears are also described as being cute and innocent. And then the text specifically says, you know, unlike Ariana herself. So From Software is really, really pointing to Ariana and, and being like, isn't she a gross, disgusting, little floozy or something? It's, it seems a little mean for me. It's tw you know, 25th century, but I know, if a lady wants to, you know, have sex with God, you know, I mean, I mean, you have to imagine that's probably pretty wonderful, right? I mean, I would want to have sex with God or Aphrodite or something. I mean, I'm just saying, if 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 Venus came to me and was like, "Would you like to to to?" I would, I would probably, I, I think that I would be a new favorite attraction or cult or group and all of Bloodborne. It used to be Mensis because Miklash kind of amused me, but now it's actually the choir. I think the choir is basically the best and most noble group in the game, probably? In Yahagul, the imprisoned and bound body of a captured choir member can be found in possession of the upper cathedral key, which states, the upper echelons of the healing church are formed by the school of Mensis, based in the unseen village, and the choir, occupying the upper cathedral cathedral ward. So the top dogs of the church are the choir and Mensis. Given that the hunter finds a dead choir member in this state in Yahagul, the unseen village, and given that the school of Mensis is headquartered here, it appears that the choir and Mensis do not get along. The NPC in the Nightmare of Mensis is actually named Choir Intelligencer Edgar, insinuating that he's actually an undercover member of the choir spying on Mensis, and members of Mensis can be summoned to fight Rom and Abriatos, who are both served by the choir. Despite being a member of Mensis, Miklash actually uses artifacts from the choir's arsenal, such as the Augur of Abritos and a Call Beyond. So the two groups are intricately intertwined with each other and are also viciously violent towards each other. The orphanage key tells us pretty much the whole story. Key to the orphanage, birthplace of the choir. The orphanage, shadowed by the Grand Cathedral, was a place of scholarship and experimentation where young orphans became potent unseen thinkers for the healing church. The choir that would later split from the healing church was a creation of the orphanage. So the orphanage created the choir. The orphanage conducts some sort of experimentation and given the pillars of smoke and coffins and such, the experimentation might not be so friendly. They might even be experimenting on members of the choir. Since the choir is said to have split from the healing church, it seems likely that it was something of a rebellion. The church pulls young prodigy children away from their biological parents and uses them for research. As they grow into adulthood, some of them use their gifts to rebel against the orphanage and usurp control. So when the upper cathedral key uses the terminology occupy, the choir occupies the orphanage, it's a very deliberate use of terminology. The choir occupies the orphanage in the same way that a military occupies a foreign territory. This also explains why the School of Mensis is based in the Unseen Village. They were at one point equals to the members of the choir, but the two groups had a disagreement and the choir violently kicked Mensis out of the orphanage and out of Yarnum. That's why they're headquartered in a secret Unseen Village. Given that the choir might have suffered mistreatment when its members were children, it might make sense that they have like a certain special sympathy for children, and since Mikolash and the members of Mensis seem perfectly willing to experiment on and dissect celestial children and keep baby Mega away from his mother, I think that's the key philosophical difference between them. And that's why they don't really like each other. It's all about, well, how should a person treat children? You know, Mensis is like, do whatever you have to, and the choir is like... <laughs> Save the children! Ha ha! So I like the choir. Or at least, this is what I personally prefer to believe. Because I think it's a pretty badass idea that the choir is made up of these hyper-intelligent superhuman children who are experimented on, and as adults they rebel against Mensis and vow to help children and orphans and that sort of thing. Or something like that, I don't know. I like that explanation best. However, it isn't actually the explanation I think is most convincing. Because the timeline is a little bit convoluted in that explanation. If there's smoke still bellowing out of the orphanage, that means the choir failed to completely usurp the orphanage. 
children are still being incinerated. If the choir was unable to overthrow the orphanage, the school of Mensis would not have been chased out of Yarnum, and they've presumably been based in the Unseen Village for a considerable period of time, so that doesn't quite add up. Once the hunter kills Rom, the Red Moon descends, so somehow Rom is keeping the Red Moon at bay. There's a scrap of paper close to where Yuri the Last Scholar resides, which reads, The spider hides all manner of ritual, certain to reveal nothing, for true enlightenment need not be shared. So presumably, the choir does not want Rom to die. There's another note by Odin Chapel which reads, The Bergenwith spider hides all manner of rituals, and keeps our lost master from us, a terrible shame, it makes my head shudder uncontrollably. And supposedly, the Japanese translation makes it a little clearer that the lost master is actually Mikolash and not Willem. So the choir is trying to keep both Mikolash trapped in the nightmare, and they're trying to keep the Red Moon away. As discussed, the various universes in Bloodborne are all stacked on top of each other. So when Rom dies, the Blood Moon literally passes through that layer of the universe and then descends to all the others below. So it's like Rom's Moonside Lake is a barrier or web that's on top of all the other layers to protect them. The Nightmare, however, is somewhere beneath the Moonside Lake, but above the waking world. So if the choir is burning children to send them to Rom, they're actually getting trapped in the Nightmare. Like a ship departs on a voyage, then it crashes on the rocks in the Nightmare. That as well could explain the tension between Mentis and the Choir. The Choir erects the Moonside Lake between the Waking World and the Blood Moon, and then Mentis erects the Nightmare between the Waking World and the Moonside Lake. There's also the consideration that when the Blood Moon descends, the line between man and beast is blurred. So the Blood Moon perpetuates or exacerbates the Beast Plague, and what keeps the beast away is actually the incense which is manufactured in the orphanage. So like the incense, Rom and the Moonside Lake actually keep the Blood Moon away. If the incense is really just vaporizing skull-dwelling parasites and slugs, and that's what keeps the beasts away, then maybe that's what's burning in the orphanage. The vaporized slugs ascend and accumulate to Rom and form as a collective organism as a defense against the Blood Moon. Sort of like how Queen Yana keeps Mergo in her womb, Rom is a similar way where she keeps the slug children in her body. She's kind of infantile like the slugs, but she also has that motherly aspect to her. When Miklash says, <laughs> So there's something about insight that prevents beasthood, and if the eyes on the inside are actually just parasite eggs, there's something about the slug phantasms that is antithetical to the beasts and the blood moon. But let's just consider for a moment that these slugs are actually like leeches. They live in the skull and suck away at a person's brain. As we've discussed, a person's identity is still preserved within the blood, even after death. So if a person's brain is sucked out by a slug, that person's consciousness and memories are actually still alive within the body of the slug. When the hunter approaches the Mad Gatekeeper, the Gatekeeper is already dead, but he also drops Madman's knowledge. Hence, there were parasites in his brain, they ate his brain, and upon becoming a gaseous spirit and being absorbed by the hunter, the hunter experiences the Gatekeeper's memory. The same may even be true of Lawrence's skull, which fumes a kind of celestial energy quite similar to what's depicted in Madman's knowledge. This might also explain the very peculiar line which can be read in Lawrence's skull. The skull is a symbol of Lawrence's past, and what he failed to protect. He is destined to seek his skull, but even if he found it, it could never restore his memories. His memories have been eaten away by the phantasm slugs, and they exist in the waking world under the control of the church. His humanity was completely consumed by the phantasms, and thus the cleric beast and the nightmare is just an empty shell of Lawrence's true identity. However, this process of experiencing other people's memories does not appear to work on everyone. The hunter is capable of approaching Lawrence's skull and hearing the true old adage, Fear the old blood. But Vicar Amelia, who's kneeling just in front of the exact same skull, repeats a slightly altered adage. Seek the old blood. She isn't able to experience Lawrence's memories the way the hunter can. And given that the choir member, Yuri, is able to get to Bergen with, she presumably is aware of the true old adage, fear the old blood. This further lends credit to the idea that the choir has some kind of innate, special ability to hear the language of the Great Ones, while most individuals in the world of Bloodborne cannot. So if the leeches host people's memories and identities, it begins to make more sense that the orphanage incinerates the celestial children to dispatch their spirits to Rom's moodside lake, a world where there's an absence of pain and fear and danger. And they all amalgamate together inside of Rom's body, in the same way that Mergo exists inside of Queen Yarnum's body. 
If those leeches consume a person's identity, a pregnant woman breathes in the spirits of those leeches and then gives birth to a celestial child, that celestial child is actually the reincarnation of all those deceased people that the slugs had consumed. If we look at the dead and underdeveloped celestial children that can be found in the lecture hall in Bergenworth, we can actually see the skulls of dead Yarnamites protruding slightly out the child's body, just as we see in the ritual blood. If the orphanage then collects and incinerates those celestial children, they're all reborn in Rom's moonside lake together as a collective body of reincarnated Yarnamites. But again, personally, I just like to think that the choir is against the act of child sacrifice, and, and they're just trying to protect uh, little baby Mergo and Rom, who Miyazaki described as being kind of infantile. But I guess it's still sort of true if, if Rom is just the amalgamative reincarnation of countless child spirits. Uh, they get to exist in a heavenly world where there is no pain or danger or fear. Uh, until the hunter arrives and murders them all like a monster, so I hope you're proud of yourself now. Okay, so just to summarize everything that we've discussed, because there's a lot here, right? The church is sending infants who show early signs of the beast plague to the orphanage to be burnt and purified. And they're incinerating slug human plants hybrids known as celestial children as well. The vaporized spirits of those children rise into the nightmare frontier where they reform as a giant lake of poison and can be absorbed by plants and mutate into plant human hybrids and can also be consumed and reformed by bottom feeding crawlers. The orphanage is also responsible for raising hyper intelligent, even gifted scientists like Yuri, Edgar, and even possibly Carol to study the cosmos. These prodigy children make up what's known as the choir, emphasizing the importance of communication or communion via song, and just as God impregnated Mary with his voice, the Great Ones mutate the children of pregnant women and turn them into slug human hybrids with their voices, which in the world of Bloodborne manifest as odors. Odin, the formless Great One, appears only in voice, and may be the vaporized spirits of skull-dwelling slugs as can be seen in Odin Chapel, the Grand Cathedral, and the Mad Gatekeeper. As those slugs suck out people's brains, the host's consciousness is still preserved within the bodies of the slugs, so when a person breathes in the vaporized slugs, they can actually re-experience a moment that the deceased host experienced independently. Choir members are also the highest ranking members of the church, and given that Yuri is capable of arriving at Bergenworth, the choir may also be aware of the true sacred adage, fear the old blood, instead of the incorrect adage that the church reiterates, seek the old blood. While the orphanage may have created the choir, the choir is no longer a part of the healing church and is actively fighting against the school of Mensis, which oversees the nightmare where the amalgamative lake of dead children's souls has accumulated. So I conclude that the choir is attempting to mutate the unborn children of pregnant women into the reincarnated vessels of deceased Yarnamites and phantasms, dispatch their souls into the cosmos, and amalgamate into Rom's vacuous body at the Moonside Lake, which exists as a realm free from beasts, free from fear, free from pain, and free from death, until the hunter arrives and messes everything up. Way to go. Minsis created a nightmare realm to capture the souls of these children for uncertain reason. Episode on Minsis coming up, stay tuned, la -ti -da, da -da -da. And that's part of the philosophical difference between the two rival cults. Well, thank you for watching. This episode was... A was 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 a monster to get through. Uh, you know how difficult a Briatos is to fight the first time you face her. Yeah, it was that difficult. I know that I said I was gonna talk about a Briatos, but then there was so much to say about the choir and the orphanage that I'm like, I'm going to have to save a Briatos for the next episode because a Briatos is actually very very fascinating. There's absolutely so much going on uh, with just like her appearance and everything, and uh, and so I'm uh, yeah, and so I like I already have a Briatos's part pretty much done. I think there's just like a little bit more that I have to do and I have to record everything and edit everything. Uh, but I, like I have the whole script written, so a Briatos is next. And I don't think it should be as long as this one, but it'll still be incredibly, incredibly fascinating. And I think it'll really explain like where the two Marians and humans came from in a Briatos and like what's going on with cause and just so much going on. Everything is so ridiculously intertwined in this game. It drives me insane sometimes. But Oh, it was a lot of fun. We did a great job. We learned a lot about the orphanage, the choirs. All right. Goodbye.